All right. Are you in a safe? Uh, are you in a safe spot now? Yeah, I'm parked. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Uh, so I used to deal with the um, the uh, uh, a, a a business rep up there for uh, Miller Tripods, who uh, whose office uh, was in Vancouver, but he <laughs> lived in Washington. And every time we used to try to talk by cell phone, I used to lose his signal as he crossed over the U.S. border from uh, Washington to uh, British Columbia. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe how much filmmaking goes on there, but you never really hear about it in the mainstream media or anything. Yeah, it's a it's, little insular. Whenever I get on Craigslist to look at lenses, there's always, yeah, always like tons and tons of stuff listed on craigslist you know nice lenses and everything right in victoria it's only like 15 miles away from where i am but you know it's, it's yeah talkable. that's terrific that's good i think you want to you want a community like that you don't want everybody coming and picking over what you've got to what you got going for you there's a couple of places like that in the lower 48 um wilmington north carolina for instance is uh is the same kind of um, enigmatic place where a lot of filmmaking goes on, but not a lot of folks know about it. They don't hear about it because it's uh, it's a small community. It's kind of off the beaten path on the coast of North Carolina where there's not a great deal of traffic. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Huh. Those are kind of nice communities, though. They're good places to learn and grow without uh, without without the pressure of too much competition and uh, and a lot of commercialism. We live. Yeah, we're you know really remote, but we get film crews out here a few times a year. Like I'm giving a tour tomorrow for location scouts um, for the Columbia Sportswear, and they're going to be doing a filming a documentary out here. Oh, terrific! All right, and well, Discovery Channel. Not Geo. Yeah, you're in a good place for that kind of content. Um, I like watching the uh, the documentaries about the um, the grizzly bear and the the whale migration and the the elk and so forth that are up in your neck of the woods. I hope you can hear yeah, me. Yeah, even okay. some of the guys. Want to do some filming out here? I hope you can hear me okay because I'm I'm getting um I'm only getting uh, a portion of what you're responding uh with uh so hopefully I'm not breaking up in return uh at least we can have somewhat of a conversation um provided your signal's okay Are you there? Yeah. Okay. I'm. Ge I am getting a. a looks like a warning indicator um, that our audio is probably going to be sketchy. So. I'm wondering if it would be better to try and call you by cell phone, than to do this uh, go to meeting since there's a lot of um, signal processing going on through the go to meeting servers. Since you're the only one that seems to have uh, checked in this evening. Do you want to try that? Oh, I can hear you fine. Okay. All right. Well, let's give this a shot. Um, I uh, I don't really have a lecture prepared um, for this go-to session, but what I did want to do is um, I did get a chance to take a look at your discussion post, and uh, I thought that we might address that um, in the time that we have, and then if you have any questions about uh, the readings of the coursework, uh, that we could go ahead and um, 
address those issues for you as well. Um, if that's okay with you, um, I will do that. I, I know you said you yeah. kind of have some video. If I show your Book of Eli clip, are you going to be able to make it out? Um, I wouldn't probably be able to see every bit of it, but I can remember it pretty well. I watched it about 20 times. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, I'm going to switch my screen then to uh, first, let's take a look at your um, discussion post, which um, is great. Uh, it, it sounds like maybe you have some advanced um, training in some of these, some of these topics. So that'll, uh, that'll give us a little bit of a shorthand. That'll be nice. Um, I see that you like the book of Eli. I agree with you. That's the, um, the Hughes brothers. Um, I worked with them on dead presidents back in, uh, gosh, 2000 and something early 2000 and no, maybe even further back than that, maybe 97. I think that's about right. 97, 98, uh, pretty talented pair of guys. Um, a little bit, uh, unconventional in their directorial approach, but what the heck, right? Um, one of the interesting things about the Book of Eli, uh, something that I, um, I I found interesting was um, that was their first foray into digital acquisition, and it was actually one of the one of the first few movies that were produced with the Red One camera. Um, so, bearing that in mind, I, I think uh, some of your observations about um, desaturation. And uh, color values, uh, while I agree with you that there is a considerable amount of post-production uh, happening to that image, um, I, I think that a certain amount of that look can be credited to the, the kind of rudimentary uh, color scheme of the Red One to begin with. The, uh, the codec from the Red One camera, the initial um, color science that they were using, um, had a particularly biased... Uh, sort of desaturated, uh, gr almost green look to it, which I kind of liked, actually. I thought it was an interesting look. Um, but nevertheless, I think that that kind of played right into the dystopic sort of color scheme and and contrast and, and sort of washed out image that they were going for in the first place. Um, uh, you indicate uh, you had you had some interesting observations about the uh, the camera movement, and you pointed out the scene, the the first fight scene uh, under the bridge. And uh, I just wanted to go over that with you because um, you had some assertions about a 180 degree flip, and I, I'm not entirely sure that that's accurate. So I went ahead and I looked at the clip a couple of times and I just wanted to do a stop and go with you and point out uh, from my experience what I, I think is happening. And you can sort of take that into consideration. Um, we can sort of analyze it, break it down together. Um, I'm going to flip over here to the YouTube link. And I think what I'll do too is turn the audio off because I don't think we need to hear the audio so much. Um, I hope you're with me. Um, here we go. So I'm going to hit play. And this scene's going to start off with the shopping cart wiping the frame right to left. And I think you're right. I think there is a, there is a small sort of side to side uh, dolly move going on here, uh, right to left, uh, in addition to her sort of counter move. Um, with whatever she's got going on here. She kind of shifts to her right, and the camera shifts to its left, and we end up with this frame of the woman on the right and Eli on the left. And so that now, this is our dolly number two, and this is going to establish now our directorial line of relationship. So we have girl on the right, Eli frame left. He's actually slightly left of center, but he is technically frame left. So as this scene unfolds, if this was if this was a 180 degree flip, um, that would have been correct if let me see if I can do this, JKL. No, nope, I can't do it. Okay. Uh, if she had stayed on this side of the frame 
and Eli had walked up, we would have assigned Eli the frame right position and given her the frame left position because she's closest to um, the frame left uh, border here. But she doesn't. With Between her shift and the camera's slide, we've now come to a number two and, ass and assigned her frame right and him frame left. So as we come around for the over, and so the, re the relationship line is now running on the left side of the frame. So it's her left and his right, okay? So she's in the right of frame, he's in the left of frame, and we're on her left or his right. As we come around for the over, we are going to stay on his right and on her left. You see, the camera hasn't jumped to the other side of this relationship. We're still on the his right side and her left side. She's still in frame right and he's still in frame left. What has happened is the foreground background relationship has changed 180 degrees because she's now small in the frame and he's large in the frame. But we've done the proper over here. We've stayed on the right side of the directorial line here. So that's okay. And the only way I think that we would have violated that 180 would have been if we did end up on his over his left shoulder. And somehow, uh, even if, and, and, and actually, if, if we ended up over his left shoulder, he would have ended up occupying a frame right position and she would have ended up, even though she was maybe only towards the center of the frame, she would have been in the wrong relationship to him because we would have been over his left shoulder and she would have then also been over his left shoulder, which would have been a flip. And the only way you could justify that is if they had continued this move from the reverse, which comes about like so, but they choose to stop here. Now they could have continued, they could have continued the move and ended up over his left shoulder. In that case, the movement of the camera reestablishes the relationship again, which is a complex move, and it's not it's not typically advised because it does sort of mess with people's mental geography and, and starts screwing with our ability to be able to figure out where everybody is. But they did stay on his right side, so I think we're okay. The only thing I have, the bone I have to pick is here, this reverse is actually, his eye line is looking right to left. And if this was correct, he should have been on this one third to the left of frame over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. And looking at what would have been, uh, if I have this correct, uh, left to right, because she's on that side of the frame. But he's looking over here the, to his own side of the frame from the previous cut. He was here, and now we're looking at him looking at himself. So his look, I believe, should have been on this one-third frame left looking at the frame right one-third, and that would have justified the look. Now, you could argue that because we don't see his eyes, uh, he could be, in fact, looking this way, although his jawline tends to lead us to the left of frame. You could argue that and say, well, he's really looking this way, and he's just short frame, or he's long framed, which is a compositional choice. But I don't think they had that much going on intellectually in this edit. I think this is just a mistake that was made. And they could have easily flipped this frame because I don't think anything really demonstrative happens here. It's just his look to her. Yeah, they could have very easily flipped that frame. And since there's no text on his T-shirt, there's no really distinct object establishing any real geography, they could have gotten away with it. And as they flipped the negative, he would have been looking in the correct direction. So I have an issue with this piece of coverage by itself. And then as we proceed, she's back on the right side of frame again. So he definitely should have been looking in this direction instead of where he was looking. So in my experience, that would be the proper interpretation of that uh, exchange and the 180 degree rule respective to the line of direct, uh, uh, the director's line. And I think as this unfolds, yeah, 
they <laughs> they kind of messed that up. Now he's walking, and the funny thing of it is, is he's walking straight at the camera as that reverse sort of matures and evolves. He walks, he ends up walking straight at the camera, which is not a violation either way. What he should have done is looked straight ahead towards the camera then if they were going to pick that uh, and, they, and they were going to focus on that move because then when they did this, they could have they could have flipped it here legally, uh, but they continue to keep her on the right side. So with the exception of that one part of the, uh, that one piece of coverage, everything seems to be conforming to 180 degrees. We still have this relationship where we're on his right. See, that's correct. They got that look right. When he looks at her here, move it. There he is. When he looks at her, that's the right direction. That's the right screen direction. That's correct. So they knew. I, makes me wonder why they didn't fix that one shot. Maybe they didn't think they could. Maybe they didn't think anyone would catch it. Um, but you did. So that's credit to you. This is good because we're still on his right shoulder. He's looking frame right, and she stays frame right. So. The rest of this seems to be, now that, let's see here. Yeah, that's okay. We're on her left and his right. Now he's going to turn around. And in doing so, if we end up in an over, yeah, see, we end up in an over. And they still respect that 180 degree rule. All they did was they exchanged these two guys for the girl. They're still going to keep them frame right and him frame left. And they're going to walk from right to left, which is correct. And now, of course, we put him bullets right in the center. So now they're going to say to you, now it's going to get complicated because we've got five guys and a girl. And we may start messing with this. Or they might go counterclockwise around the shot clock and always keep him in our frame left. If they do that, then they're going to remain consistent throughout the geography. Let's see what they do. Now, he's looking in the wrong direction unless he's referring to the girl. He should be looking frame left to refer to Eli, but I think he's referring to his buddy. So frame right to his buddies and the girl, frame left to uh, to Denzel. And that's correct because he's going to turn and look at Denzel and say, what's in the bag? So that's correct. So that was a, what we call a split look. He looks frame right to one character and then frame left to the other character. So this guy's splitting his looks, but he's he is going to keep Denzel on our left of frame. So this is all consistent. And Denzel stays on the left of frame looking right, so he's correct. And that stays correct. We're over Denzel onto the crew. And the crew is all looking frame left at Denzel, so that's good. I think he's going to pretty much follow this all the way through the scene. Yep. Now, when he goes into the tunnel, yeah, see here, the, the crew's on the right, and Denzel's on the left. This is a, a, a secondary consideration, this guy over here. As long as when we go to his coverage, we do it over Denzel's right shoulder, like if Denzel were to turn and look at this guy, as long as we keep Denzel to our left and look over his right shoulder at this guy, then we will maintain the integrity of our 180 degree. Some directors would say, ah, screw it. We'll just take him however we can take him, or we won't cover him at all. If that's the case, we don't worry. Um, but the crew's on the right. Denzel's on the left. Denzel's on the left looking to the right. That's good. And the leader is bullets again, but he's looking frame left at Denzel. So that's cool. And the girl's on frame right, looking frame left. Frame left, looking frame right. Bullets, bullets, but looking right. Camera right, I should say. Crew's on the right, Denzel's on the left. Now, 
bad guy number one is also in Denzel's position. So anything over bad guy number one's shoulder should be off his right shoulder as well as he addresses the rest of his crew. Let's see if they do that correctly. Yeah, that's good. That was a split two. So that's, that's fine because they're both on the right side of the frame. He's in the right spot and he's in the right spot. Correct, I should say. All right, so that's all, that's all correct. And those looks are right to left. His look to Denzel is right to left. Looks to the crew, left to right, once he hits his knees. So, yeah. And then they're going to go under the bridge, and he's going to chop them all up into herring. But in the process of doing that, they still keep Denzel in the center of the frame, but and splitting his looks left and right, but the final chop is frame left to right. So that's all. That's all good. Split looks. He finishes this guy off. And then he's going to go. He's going to walk back outside. Oh, well, anyway, he walks back outside and everybody's happy. So I think they're okay with the exception of that one violation in the coverage, which is, you know, only folks like us who make movies are going to be concerned with that one small error. But um, learning and knowing the geography and then knowing the times when you can sort of um, violate that uh, 180 degree rule are important if you're in lighting or camera. Now, <clears throat> the majority of my career, I was in the lighting department. I didn't get to the camera department. Uh, well, actually, I was in the camera department twice uh, as a very young person, as a loader and a, a camera assistant. I was in the camera department. Um, and then I left to do lighting for a number of years um, and then re-entered the camera department in my later years uh, as a cameraman. But um, so I learned my, uh, I learned my sense of uh, geography uh, as a gaffer and having to keep track of where people were going to be. So I knew where I could put my lights and where I had to power things from and where the camera was likely to look and pan, uh, what uh, what angles were going to be fair game for camera to work with and what angles were going to be uh, protected where I could stage gear and I could have people waiting behind camera to work on the next shot. So from a utilitarian standpoint, just knowing where to claim my piece of the pie in terms of how the set is portioned out um, was really important. So knowing the coverage and knowing the 180 degree uh, limitations was important in that regard. Um, it's also important if you're going to be, you know, shooting for an edit, you want to make sure that you know what, where, you know, which direction to put your looks. In a situation where you got people that are wearing ND clothing, ND meaning nondescript, um, you can always flip the neg and you know show somebody's look in the correct direction as long as there's no establishing background that's going to suffer for it. Like for instance, um, if you're shooting exteriors in LA and everybody knows that you know they've been watching a scene between two guys unfold in a parking lot, and and, and we know that uh, for instance the um, uh, the U.S. Bank building. Uh, which is the tallest building on the Los Angeles skyline. If we've been looking the whole time and that building's been frame left and all of a sudden we see uh, a piece of film where we've been watching this guy now for several exchanges in the edit and all of a sudden the U.S. bank building flips from the camera frame left to camera frame right, we're going to know that something fishy's going on. It's going to stand out in our mind. But if, if we got an ND background, trees, mountains, sky, clouds, you know, a lot of times we can get away with just flipping the neg. Um, and then, the, of course, the other things, and, and like if you work with people like, of course, he's deceased now, but like Tony Scott used to move the camera a lot. So, you know, if you start splitting looks and moving the camera, you know, and putting the reverse in the frame as the 
camera trucks by and changes the line from right shoulder to left shoulder, as long as those movements stay consistent and then all the coverage from that point on uh, becomes recalibrated to the change in line, then you're okay because you have, in the course of a scene, you have changed the directorial line, and sometimes that's necessary. And when you do, you have to then change everybody's look relationships in order for the audience not to get lost in terms of where we left our, our actors in the dialogue. So, um, but if, you, if, if none of those situations apply, then uh, it's just a matter of, you know, uh, making sure you're on the correct shoulder for the over and then keep, you know, consulting the script supervisor. They're, they're your best uh, resource on the set in terms of somebody who's keeping track of the geography um, because it's the script supervisor's notes who are then going to uh, be given to the editor and the editor's going to use uh, that person's notes about continuity of props, wardrobe, dialogue, uh, lens sizes for coverage, uh, look directions, all of that stuff. And the easiest thing to do, and I've done it many times, is you know if I get lost in where we're supposed to be, or if we pick up a shot that doesn't fit with what we were we've been doing, like uh, from work from the previous day, that's you know something that they've added to the uh, to the to the shot list for the day. I might ask the script super, you know, when we did this yesterday, uh, were we looking you know, frame left or were we looking frame right? When we did the overs, were we on his right shoulder or his left shoulder? And where was the girl in relationship to Denzel? Was he on the right or the left? Who was looking which way? And she'll have all that in her notes. So, or he, uh, for that matter, but typically I've worked with female script supervisors. Um, so I have a little bit of a, an auto chauvinism there, sorry. Um, but the script super is going to have all those notes and, uh, you know, they're your first line of defense if, if you've lost track somehow. Like, you know, you step up, go to craft service for a cup of coffee. Somebody covers you on set and they and they do a quick piece of coverage and something happens and you come back and you're, well, wait a minute. You know, we were over here before. Now we're over here. What happened? Well, we did this and this and everything's the same. So, you're, you know, you can step right back in and, and get involved or, you know, make a quick adjustment. Uh, does any of that make sense to you? <laughs> Is my mic still on? Yeah, I hear you. Did Did you get all of that? Does that all make sense? Or yeah, I, yeah, I understood it all. Okay. Were you able to see the the video at all, or was that just fruitless? <laughs> It was updating about every 10. Oh, it was? Well, what, you know what I'll do is uh, I, I can record that uh, over again yeah. for you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go over your video clip again tomorrow um, and send you, uh, send you the same notes again. Um, I'll send them right to you, to your email. So okay. you can take a look at it again. Um, so that's basically, you know, at least from my point of view, that's the 180 degree rule in terms of coverage. Um, and then always keep in mind that, um, I mean, I've worked for a couple of DPs, uh, in my time that, um, uh, I've told them, you know, wait a minute, you know, this shot that you're setting up for is going to, is going to flip the, either flip the line or flip my key light, uh, in a way that's going to stand out in the edit. And um, I've had uh, DPs respond a couple of times that they really weren't concerned, uh, that they were more concerned with uh, the fact that the shot looked really good and they liked everything they were seeing and that, that they wanted to shoot it the way it was and they didn't want me to fix what I was concerned with. And so at that point, uh, you know, maybe as a gaffer, I have to say, well, OK, you know, it's you know, it's your ball game you know, you shoot it however you, you, you see fit. And then you can answer to the director for the error in coverage when the editor starts screaming. But, 
Uh, so a lot of times you have to let that go if it, uh, if it exceeds your pay grade. Um, and as a cameraman, um, you, you, of course you have the power to correct that as the cameraman, as long as the director doesn't, uh, protest, uh, the change that you're making and, and insist that you shoot the scene the way you've got it, the way you've got it blocked out. Uh, in that case, again, you have to say, well, I, I concede to your authority because, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, you'll answer to the producers or the audience for that matter, uh, when the, uh, when the complaints start rolling in. So at some point you can bring this to people's attention and then you have to sort of rely on, uh, the chain of command and, and, you know, have faith in the people that you work for that, you know, they're, they're not going to, um, want to accommodate those types of, uh, willful errors, um, you know, on a regular basis. So, uh, be, you know, aside from that, you know, I, I think usually when you bring that to somebody's attention, they're pretty happy to quickly, you know, take into account what's been mapped out and, and what's been marked out on the floor and they'll, uh, and they'll just run it through their mind really quick, uh, right to left, left to right. The overs were here. The coverage was, yeah, yep. We're okay. We can go or, Oh, you're right. You know, let's, let's, make a quick adjustment. Either it's a shift over one shoulder to the other, or, you know, I flip a key light or whatever it is, you know, to keep the relationship correct and proper. So, um, it's good that you're thinking about stuff like that. Um, it means that, you know, if you're a shooter, you'll always shoot and edit. Editors will love you. Script supers will love you. Uh, and if you're looking at lighting, uh, lighting is a career. It's good to worry about that kind of thing so that you get your, your lighting geography correct because <clears throat> we you could end up with what we call dancing key lights uh, in an edit uh, if you have your key on the wrong side of the frame or your key keeps flipping and and you weren't paying attention or keeping track when they do the edit and the coverage a lot of times you'll get the the key lights uh, blinking on and off on on somebody's face during some coverage if you're not paying attention to where your light's supposed to be. <laughs> And that can be very distracting for an editor and for an audience. So uh, from a lighting standpoint, it's a, it's a real no-no uh, if you get that wrong. So the fact that you're willing to tackle that concept early in your career is, is probably a very good thing. I was just watching the first Dumb and Dumber, all the action going backwards, you know, right to left instead of usually, you know, it goes left to right for when Lloyd was going the wrong way in the freeway, then they had him going right or left to right. <laughs> That's good. That's funny. Uh, are you, uh, incidentally, now that I, I know that I mentioned it, what, uh, what trade craft are you inter most interested in? Or do you want to be an editor or a cameraman or what? Um, I like doing everything, but I, I think I'm more, John toward like a director or cameraman. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, good. I mean, you're going to want to know how to produce coverage. If you're going to be a cameraman, you got to know how to do it. So that's excellent. Very good. Um, have you, uh, that's a good choice, by the way, Book of Eli. I, I, uh, I like that movie for a lot of reasons. And the, and the camera work is actually pretty, pretty outstanding in that, in that film. Um, uh, as far as the, uh, the content for week one, it's, it's all about exposure and exposure control. So I don't know if you've had a chance to look at any of that material yet. Yeah, I did. And one thing that really confused me was why is it that the 18% gray card is supposed to be exposed at 50%? <laughs> they should call it a 50% card. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, it used to be that we had, uh, we had a, a skin tone IRE line on, um, on a, uh, on a waveform monitor and, uh, 18% gray, uh, was the, the line on the waveform that represented all of the value the average of all of the values that were visible in the scene from absolute black to absolute white 
So it doesn't necessarily end up being 50%. For instance, if you have, uh, <clears throat> if you have a, uh, a scene that's real low key and uh, there's very little highlight going on, um, like, a, like a night interior scene um, where all you're using is moonlight, for instance, uh, your moonlight is usually, well, my moonlight used to be about a stop and a half under key. Uh, and if that's the case, and a stop and a half under key is the brightest value in the frame, then you're not going to have any values at 90 IRE. You're not going to have any values at 80 IRE or at 70 IRE, probably. Everything's going to settle or peak out around maybe 60 IRE. Um, flat, properly exposed flesh exists at usually about uh, anywhere from 23 to 26 IRE or used to be with film. Um, so that 18% gray is going to shift. So they figure 18% of, of the possible values, but that gray card, that gray card's value is actually going to change depending on how much high key value you have in a scene versus low key value. So if you have a lot of low key value, that 18%, uh, v that true value of that card is, is going to be something different. And likewise, if you have a lot of white value in the frame, it's going to change the, the value of that card. So I think the 18% moniker is just something that, uh, that you know, fell into place and everybody could relate to it um, when, if you're using, you know, a complex way of metering exposure like the zone system, for instance, which this course touches on, but I wouldn't recommend worrying about it so much in the digital age because it... Um, it's it's so uh, arbitrary now um, because we have so much control in post production, uh, and because the preference now seems to be to shoot um, uh, uh, low compression, low contrast uh, raw files, and then create all of our our gamma uh, or contrast in post. Um, and given that scenario, of course, you know the gray card is is right out the window, but. It's nice, for instance, to use a gray card if you're trying to calibrate exposure with a camera um, and you can assign it, you know, a nice beefy value um, along with a, like a color chart, like a Macbeth chart or, uh, oh gosh, there's a number of companies now that put out uh, chip charts where you can calibrate exposure uh, or quality of lenses and use an 18% gray scale, um, or gray card rather. Um, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't concern yourself. I had a real big problem. Um, if you uh, if you take an eighteen percent, if you like using um, exposure meters, for instance, um, if you take, um, for instance, I got a little. Uh, I got a Sakonic here. Um, so if you're using your Sakonic, this is a uh, 508. Yeah, this is a 508 Cine. Okay. Um, if you're using this like a like an incident meter, all right, and you're checking your values with your with your diffusion sphere, um, you're taking uh, incident values that are then going to be um, calculated in this meter uh, using using an algorithm that's going to favor uh, something like an 18% value reading. Uh, and what it's trying to do is it's trying to bias for flesh. So where is, where is a good flesh exposure going to happen on the IRE scale from seven to 90? And I say seven to 90 because uh, in the days of film, almost nobody or in early video, almost nobody used the entire zero to hundred percent IRE scale for calculating exposure electronically. They left 7% on the bottom for absolute black and the 10% the above 90 for absolute white. So all the other values of exposure happen between 7% and 90%. So when they were looking for a good flesh tone, they figured 18 to 20% was a good flesh tone uh, measured this way. Uh, with your color meter, and then everything above, say, 20%, which from 20 to 90 could accommodate all of your highlights. Um, so if you took a reading with this meter, say you went in the center of your set, you just got done lighting your whole set, and you went and you just took a, 
uh, reading to camera to figure out what your environment was living at, what exposure your environment was, uh, you'd get a reading, say, you know, uh, T4 at 24 frames per second at ISO 500, let's say. <clears throat> if you then took your um, spot meter reading uh, of the gray card in the center of the set, those values should compare pretty closely, if not exactly. And if they didn't, either you had a bias in your exposure value that you was intentional, like you liked things a little overexposed or a little underexposed, or you had to correct something in your lighting to make those two readings compare. So if you're using a meter, a gray card can be kind of handy for that in that respect, especially if you're using a spot meter. Um, it also gives like a color timer a good place to start looking for the proper flesh tone value. If they have that 18% card in the frame, you shoot, say for instance, you shoot somebody's headshot for a lipstick commercial. And in the first few frames of pre-roll, you put a grayscale or a gray card down here, maybe with a grayscale on it and a color scale. Uh, and then you pull it out <clears throat> and then you shoot your shot. The colorist can take that little piece from the pre-roll and calibrate accordingly and then look for the proper exposure for flesh by using what he knows of that gray card and what that value should be at 500 ISO uh, with that particular codec and compression and all of the stuff that he's worried about he can calculate what a proper exposure would be. And if he sets to that and looks at your image and the image agrees, then he knows he can continue through the whole, the whole piece of film and, and color correct accordingly. And if it doesn't, he has to make adjustments uh, to what he's doing in order to give a good flesh tone. So <clears throat> it's really about color science more than it is about exposure because exposure is really arbitrary. You can make exposure, whatever you want. In fact, this meter, and I can dial a bias into this meter and have this meter consistently give me <clears throat> readings that are a quarter of a stop hot, a third of a stop hot, half a stop hot, full stop hot, two stops hot, and the same way in the other direction. I can calibrate it to give me biases for underexposure. <clears throat> I, am, I can constantly mess with exposure variables in order for the image to settle in the way I want it to look. Uh, when we project it or when we when we broadcast it, um, which is to say that the engineer at the studio also has the ability to tweak all of those those things as well. So we have to make sure that we are both talking. The colorist and the cinematographer are talking about and agreeing on <clears throat> what the proper exposures look like, and that will have also things to consider like filtration. If I've put color filtration in the camera or if I've put neutral density in the camera or if I've put um, uh, contrast control in the camera or diffusion, um, all of that stuff factored in. And then we both agree when I do stuff like that, that exposure is going to look like this. And then when we have timing sessions at the end of filming or maybe on a weekly basis, if we're on a TV show, for instance, we'll go in and set parameters for proper exposure and then we'll say okay here's your gray card you shot in pre-roll here was my exposure value based on what i thought it should look like this was the result do you like that flesh tone or not do we go brighter or darker with it we, do we go pinker or greener with it do we go redder or bluer with it and then we make those fine adjustments and then we lock that in and we call that our look and when we have that look we we use that as our base for correction for everything that we do. Uh, and then we only deviate from that uh, in when uh, somebody announces that there's been a change, like the cinematographer or the director announces there's a change in the look for whatever reason. Uh, episode to episode, for instance, is a good time to change a look. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll create a, say, a lookup table, for instance, with those parameters dialed in, and we can load that into the camera, or we can load, the DIT can load that data into his monitors, 
so that as we pipe signal from the camera to the DIT's monitor, the director's looking at a monitor, the lookup table gets applied to what's coming out of the camera in case we're shooting a raw uncompressed image. The lookup table bakes that into the monitor and then the director watches the corrected look on the monitor on set um, to keep from getting confused between the raw look, which is totally inaccurate and uncorrected, and the baked in lookup table that we created in, in uh, post with the colorist. Am I making sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if you have questions, you can always stop me or you can, you know, write them down, send me an email or whatever, and I'll be happy to address them for you. Um, I'm giving you a more technical discussion because I got the impression that you maybe had an above average understanding of what was going on. Yeah, I had trouble with exposure a couple of weeks ago. I was shooting a wedding and there was a lot of backlighting and... Um, I just went off the histogram on the camera and then uh -huh. when I got to go editing, um, the backlighting was at a hundred percent, but a lot, a lot of my subjects were underexposed. Yeah. And there was really no way to see that in the, when I was filming, cause every, everything looks like, like it was blown out. Yeah. The thing about backlights is they are, they represent the kind of exposure value that you would get if you looked directly at a light. Um, it's a reflection, but it's a, it's an optimized reflection. So it, it represents, it, it's a misrepresented exposure value to the camera. Um, the sky does the same thing. If you, if you go outside and you, uh, and, and say you take your light meter and you go and you, take a shot of a bride under a tree and you can see the sky in the background. If you're exposed for under the tree, the sky is going to blow out. If you're exposed for the sky, everything under the tree is going to look underexposed. So what you need is you need that sky value and you need the shadow value at the same time, which is what we call high dynamic range. Um, and a lot of times you can't achieve that. The cameras are starting to offer those features, uh, still cameras in particular, you can shoot, high dynamic range files. And what'll happen is uh, like on a Canon camera, for instance, if you're in HDR mode um, and you shoot a frame in HDR mode, the camera will actually take three shots. <clears throat> it'll take an 18% shot. It'll take a shot biased for overexposure and a shot biased for underexposure for a total of three shots. Okay. And then in, in software inside the processor, it will merge all three of those values and give you a high dynamic range resulting image uh, that you can then manipulate as well. So um, you need high dynamic range in situations like that. And when you've got a lot of backlight, what you can say to yourself mentally is, well, I'm not going to try and preserve as much detail in the highlights that reside in the backlight. I'm going to let them over modulate or I'm going to let them uh, what we call clip, which is they're going to go over 100% IRE on our histogram. So that very top line on your histogram, I think in your camera, it might be red. <clears throat> you're going to see all the way to the left, you're going to see a spike and it'll go over that red line and that's your highlight line. And if that's where your backlight highlights reside, let them go and keep your flesh tone hump you know, your mid-range hump, anywhere from 18 to, say, 30, so 20 to 30 percent, which is like almost central on that histogram. It's a little biased a little bit to the left. Make sure that that hump is nice and, and, and rich, and that'll be your, your mid-range exposure, and then your shadows will fall off again to the other side um, and probably hit the bottom or maybe, you know, dip up slightly just before they hit the bottom, uh, which means they're staying inside a zero percent. Um, and just, you know, understand that your highlights are going to lose some value because they're going to clip or overmodulate. They're going to go over 100% because you want your mid-range value to slide a little bit more to the left. Or, I'm sorry, to the right. So if you're going to, if you're going to shoot a close-up, oh, if you're going to shoot a close-up of somebody and you would, you would expose them about 30%, 
Um, it all depends. Now, with 800 ISO, I've heard that guys are exposing flesh as high as 60 IRE. <clears throat> and I don't know. That's awful hot. Um, but it all depends on what your background is doing and what, what other values in the frame are doing. You know, if the, you know, like if you're doing a L'Oreal commercial, you know, I'm beautiful, don't hate me because I'm beautiful, you know, and it's just a model in the frame and <clears throat> everything else is somewhat dark except for her visage, then her face might be at 80, at 60 IRE, you know, it, it might be that high. Um, but if you've got a lot going on in the frame, uh, flesh should be somewhere around anywhere from, I say 23 to 26 myself. But if you, you know, if you're somewhere around 30, all of that can be pulled into place in post. You can tweak those values and, and, and get that exposure to look nice in post. You don't have to worry. If you're off by 5 or 10%, you'll be okay. Somebody with, somebody with really dark skin is obviously it's going to be less reflective. Yeah. Well, they're going to have a different, yeah, they're going to have a different reflectivity, um, but you're going to light somebody with dark skin differently than you light somebody with white skin anyway. So, <clears throat> and that might be a, a conversation for another day or for, uh, for when I get you in lighting too. But basically a dark skin person uh, has a totally different, at least in my world, has a totally different approach to lighting. And I try to see highlights reflected in the skin value of a darker person. That way I create the illusion of, of a brighter skin tone by being able to see the reflections of my light sources in the person's skin. Um, if you do any product work or you're shooting a lot of weddings, if you ever shoot an, any high key objects like um, tablecloths with wine glasses on it or silverware and, and wedding cakes and things of that nature. Uh, wine bottles and shiny silverware, for instance, uh, <clears throat> successful photographs of, of that kind of subject matter is all about where you put the highlights. And a, a shiny object like a, a wine bottle or a glass orb or a silver spoon, um, no matter how much light you pump onto that subject, it's not going to improve the luminosity of that subject. The way you improve the luminosity of that subject is by carefully placing highlights of reflectivity in the surface of that object that the camera can then record. And when you do that, you create the illusion of a brighter object, but really all you've done is put a highlight in there that you could see and identify. And that's how I deal with people of color as well, because they have the same sort of exposure problem and that you can pump as much light as you want onto a black guy. But if, you know, if the light isn't in a situation where you see it reflected in his forehead and in his cheeks, <clears throat> you're going to, you're going to have a difficult time getting that individual's exposure to look right in post. And every time you try to do something to it, you're going to affect other values in the frame. So that's uh, that's a technique maybe for another day. Um, but I'm glad that you brought that up because we do kind of cover that in, in lighting too a little bit. Anything else from the uh, week one materials that stood out to you as, as needing clarification or? I didn't get that. I don't know if you were responding or I got a lot of static. Oh, I just said, that, yeah, that's the only questions I had. Okay. There you are. Okay, good. Those two. All right. Um, well, that's our time. If you, uh, if you come up with any, any questions or if you have any, uh, if you're thinking this over and you, and you, and you think of anything else, uh, that you need clarification on, feel free to you know shoot me an email or uh, call the office number and leave me a message, and I'll I'll get back to you. Or we can do another uh, phone session if you want as well. Um, just let me know.
Okay, thanks. All right, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. It's nice talking with you. All right, see you at night. Have a good night.